just hang tight there for a moment. I won't have you turn quite yet to a passage, but um, it's good to have uh, visiting with us James, and he's new to the area. We're thankful uh, to have him with us. Be sure to greet him uh, before you leave today. And uh, in your Bibles this morning, what I'd like to do is take a look at Bible principles for wholehearted giving. We continue in our consideration of spiritual disciplines in which every believer must be wholehearted. We've seen the profile of a wholehearted church. We've seen what's required for wholehearted confession, wholehearted fellowship, wholehearted obedience. And last week we uh, looked at a wholehearted approach towards God's word from Psalm 119. But our material giving to the Lord is a spiritual discipline that we cannot ignore, minimize, or shortchange. You and I who know Jesus Christ as our Savior have to understand that have to understand what God requires of us in order for God to receive the proper glory and worship from us. I think we all would agree that our purpose is to glorify God. And our material giving to the Lord is a very important part of that. What you won't find in scriptures is a dollar amount that God requires of you. But you will find a number of principles that he supplied to you and I to determine with the Holy Spirit's help what God-honoring giving looks like. And I'd like to examine some of those principles with you this morning. Let's pause for prayer and ask for the Lord's help. Father, we uh, need you to open our eyes to your truth. We need you to convict our hearts of, Lord, our uh, shortfall in regard to your truth. And then we need, Lord, your help just to soften our hearts and give us obedient attitudes toward what you show us today. And we do pray, Lord, that in all things you'd be glorified. May your name be exalted and may nothing but your truth be spoken here this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Principles for wholehearted giving will break these biblical principles into three categories. And I'd like you to consider number one, that, a wholehearted, that, that wholehearted giving requires a proper understanding. A proper understanding. And there's three things that I think are important for us to understand in regard to wholehearted giving. Number one, the first principle here is that we are stewards. We are stewards. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 145, and I'd like you to take a look at two verses here that highlight this truth. Psalm 145, verses 15 and 16. You and I are not independent individuals. Sometimes we like to think of ourselves that way. But we are not independent. We are dependent Upon our Creator. Psalm 145, verses 15 and 16. The eyes, of all that w the eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. Do you see the dependence that you and I have upon God? In other words, God owns everything, and what you and I have, he has given to us. We are not what we are in and of, in, of, in and of ourselves. We do not have what we have in and of ourselves. We don't provide from our own hand. Ultimately, everything we have comes from God. That makes us stewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul told those believers to let a man so account of us or think of us as, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In that sense, uh, Paul explains that we are stewards of God's 
truth. And then he says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You and I are stewards. We don't own anything, technically. God could take it all away from us in the blink of an eye, couldn't he? We are simply stewards of what God has entrusted us with. In fact, in Romans chapter 14, and verse 12, we are told, as Paul writes to the, uh, to the Roman believers, that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That makes you and I stewards. What we have from God, we will give an account for to him. In Luke chapter 19 and verses 12 through 27, we won't turn there or take the time to read through it, but Jesus gives a parable there of three stewards. And his point and his purpose in giving that parable is to, is to uh, uh, warn the children of Israel, the people of God, that God had blessed them with many things. His blessings abounded to his people. And they were responsible to him to take those blessings and to reap profit from them that would bring glory to him, their master. And it's no different in your life or in my life as it was for God's people. God has entrusted us with, he has blessed us with, he has given us resources that we are accountable to him for. That makes us stewards. What we have, we have from God. It is ours only to use for God's glory. And so if you are going to be a wholehearted giver, you must have a proper understanding, number one, of the fact that you are a steward. Number two, I'd like you to consider that we must understand that we are bound to give. It is an imperative, it is a requirement for God's people to give. Going all the way back to Cain and Abel, do you remember what happened there between them? Cain sacrificed of the fruit of the ground. He was a farmer. Abel sacrificed a lamb. He was a shepherd. Going all the way back to Cain and Abel, we find the biblical mandate to give to God what he rightfully deserves out of what he's given us to be stewards of. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, reminds us of Abraham giving a tenth to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who is a type of Christ. Giving is seen in the early church in Acts chapter 2 in verse in Acts chapter 2 and in chapter 5. It's seen to be a regular spiritual discipline. We'll talk in a little bit briefly about the, the uh, Israelites in the promised land. And God laid out very distinct, very specific requirements for their giving. Paul speaks frequently in his letters regarding the responsibility that the believer has to give back to God. The responsibility of the believer to give to God is well established throughout the scriptures. You and I are bound to give. We're stewards. We're bound to give. And then the third thing that you and I must have a proper understanding of this morning is that we give to God. We give to God. Ultimately, He is the beneficiary. He is the intended beneficiary of our giving. It's an act of worship. It's an act of thanksgiving and praise to who he is and to what he's done, to what he is doing. We have, we have to understand that when the Spirit prompts us to give to someone in need, when we write out our regular giving check to the church and we place it in the plate, when we sacrifice financially as a spiritual discipline, we are giving to God. He is the recipient. 
So if we will give wholeheartedly, if we will be wholehearted givers, we must have a proper understanding that we are stewards, we are bound to give, and that when we give, we give, ultimately, we're giving to God. I'd like you to consider, number two, that wholehearted giving requires a proper motivation. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The bottom line is that when God's people don't give or don't give as he leads them, they don't have a proper motivation for giving. Wholehearted giving requires a proper motivation. And what is the motivation for you and I to give? Well, consider this, number one, Christ's example. Christ's example. You see, there is no greater example of sacrificial giving than Christ himself. Paul told the Philippian believers in his second chapter in that letter that Christ emptied himself. On the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, knowing full well that he was paying the price for that forgiveness by, by giving himself to be the sacrificial lamb for your sin. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul says this, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So we have in Christ an example of giving. Seeing him, uh, seeing his ultimate sacrificial gift, you and I lack no motivation to sacrificially give in a material way to that father that James describes as the one from whom every good gift and every perfect gift comes down. So if you need motivation to be a wholehearted giver, you need only look at Christ. He's your motivation. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Another biblical principle of motivation for giving is the principle of sowing and reaping. We find in Scripture that this principle envelops every aspect of the Christian life. We often think of it in terms of material giving, financial giving. But really the, the, the idea of sowing and reaping goes back to God's nature, who he is, right? We find in Jesus' words, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. Isn't that the sowing and reaping principle, right? You reap what you sow. If you hold on to your life and you save it, you're going to lose it. But if you give freely and openly to the Lord of your life, you'll reap the rewards. You'll save it. Paul uses it in reference to giving when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just across the page in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. He says, But this I say, he that soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. This is the principle of sowing and reaping. It's important for us to think not simply in terms of financial, uh, uh, financial reaping. Okay? We may sow financially to the work of God, but our reaping may be of a different form, and usually it is. But the principle of sowing and reaping is in 
uh, is in Scripture, and Paul here applies it to materially giving to the Lord. When Joseph rebuked his, uh, excuse me, when Jehovah rebuked his people through the prophet Malachi in chapter three of that prophecy, he set before them a challenge that underscored this principle of sowing and reaping. This is what he said: Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In essence, God is saying, prove me, show me, uh, let, let me show you that this principle of sowing and reaping is real, it works, it's biblical. It's my nature. Your material sowing in the work of the Lord will reap for you a great reward from the great rewarder. And this is to be your motivation for wholehearted giving. We see Christ's example. We see in Scripture that principle of sowing and reaping. Uh, that, that he that soweth sparingly will reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully will reap bountifully. But I'd like you to consider, thirdly, this principle, and that is your faith. Your faith is to be your motivation for giving. A critical component of your giving must be faith. When you give to God... It must be in faith. You see, faith motivates giving because it trusts God as the giver of all good things and the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. In other words, you're placing into God's hand in complete dependence and trust. You're giving back what He's given to you, knowing that He's promised to care for your needs. What did David say? I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. That's the faith principle with which you and I must approach our giving. Turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 12 and consider with me An illustration from the ministry of Jesus, Mark chapter 12, the very end of that chapter, we read that Jesus sat over against the treasury. He's in the temple there in Jerusalem and beheld, he beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Now they must have been scratching their heads, a little confused. Two mites? How could that be more than these who are casting in great amounts from their riches? He explains in verse 44 that they did cast in of their abundance. In other words, they put in just a portion of the wealth that they had. But she, of her want, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Two extremes here. Two extremes. Here are those who are wealthy, casting in a large amount, but a small amount in proportion to what they had in the bank. And here was a poor widow, and all she had was two mites. And she cast them both in. She cast in all of her living. This is giving motivated by faith. Of her want did she did cast in all that she had, even all her living. 
And the only way she could do that, folks, was with a heart of faith that obeyed and trusted God to take care of the outcome. She didn't know what the next day would bring. She didn't know where her next meal would come from, but she knew that wholehearted giving in faith would be rewarded. Too often, our giving is motivated by fear or by worry or concern based upon our want. But in order to be wholehearted in your giving, it must be motivated by faith based upon God's supply. Don't give in fear. Don't give in worry or concern based upon your want. Give in faith based upon God's supply. And so we see that wholehearted giving requires a proper motivation We must give by faith, in faith, with faith. But I'd like you to consider thirdly this morning that wholehearted giving requires a proper manner. A proper manner. How do we give? In our first two points, we've answered the question, why must we give? Right? We're stewards. We're bound to give by God's command. We give to God. We give because of Christ's example. We give because if we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. We give because we trust God. We have faith in Him. And so we've answered the question, why must we give? But in this third point, we'll answer the question, how must we give? Wholehearted giving requires a proper manner. Let's consider four principles here. Of biblical giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if you would. 1 Corinthians 16. And the first point to consider here is that wholehearted giving is proportionate. Is proportionate. As we seek God's leading in our material giving, we must consider how God has prospered us and we must give in proportion to that. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. Wholehearted giving is proportionate. God's principle for Israel go all the way back to the book of Leviticus and God's principle there that we find for Israel was that their giving begin with a tenth of all of their increase. If they grew crops, they were to reap those crops and they were to take a tenth first and offer it to God. If they raised animals, they were to take a tenth of all the increase of those animals for the year and give that to God. His principle was that their giving begin with a tenth of all their increase. It was taken off the top, so to speak, and it it, it was therefore called the first fruits of their increase. It was not what was left over after their personal needs had already been met. I think sometimes that's the way that we as believers approach giving to God. Well, Lord, if if I have a little bit left at the end of the week, I promise I'll give that to you. That's not wholehearted biblical giving. They gave a tenth. They started with a tenth. That tenth was proportional giving. But understand that it didn't just start and end with a tenth. In addition to the tithe, there were other requ- there, there were other offerings required for other occasions. There was the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering and the drink offering, etc. These were all in addition to the tenth, the first fruits of their increase. 
And all of these were given out of what Jehovah had already given them, and thus their giving was proportional to God's blessing. And so wholehearted giving is proportionate. But I'd like you to consider, number two, that wholehearted giving is willing. When giving in Scripture is exemplified, it's done willingly. Though it is required by God, it is not forced, but it is always a choice of a yielded will. Turn with me, if you would, a couple of pages over to 2 Corinthians 8 once again. 2 Corinthians 8. And notice with me in the first couple of verses here, where he talks, he, he's talking about the gracious way in which God's people had supported God's work. And he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God, or take, take knowledge of the grace of, of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. What were they willing for? Verse 4, praying with us, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. These were willing givers. Did they have much? No. They're described here as being in deep poverty, but... What else did they have? They had an abundance of joy. Though in a great trial of affliction and deep poverty, they had an abundance of joy. And because of that, they willingly gave to the Lord. Remember back in Mark 12 where we read about the woman who cast those two mites into the treasury. Jesus said of her, this widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury for all they did, uh, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even of her living. Do you see a willingness there? You can't give wholeheartedly without being willing. Across the page in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. Chapter 9 and verse 7. Following that verse, verse 6 there where he gives the principle of reaping and uh, sowing and reaping. He says in verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. In other words, is to come out of a willing heart. A willing heart is a yielded, surrendered heart. It is a heart that is open, not tight-fisted, but an open heart, willing to give as God's Spirit leads and as His Word directs. So to give wholeheartedly, you must give willingly, not out of compulsion. The willing heart is one that has a proper understanding of giving and one that has a proper motivation for giving. Wholehearted giving is willing. Consider number three, that wholehearted giving is also sacrificial. It's sacrificial. The human heart naturally seeks its own satisfaction. It leads us to live with clenched fists, holding on to all that we can for ourselves. But that's not wholehearted giving, because wholehearted giving is sacrificial. The way, that, that way of life, uh, 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 seeking our own satisfaction and living with clenched fists, holding on to all that we can for ourselves, that way of living gives no glory to God. It takes the glory from God. Giving in Scripture is sacrificial 
back in Malachi chapter 3, the people of God are rebuked for the way that they're giving because they are not giving sacrificially. What did God require? He required a pure sacrifice, an unblemished sacrifice. And what were they giving? They were giving the worst instead of the best. They weren't giving sacrificially. They were giving what they didn't want. Sacrificial giving gives God the best. It yields to God what is rightfully his and has no concern for loss. As we saw in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians verses 2 and 3, these people gave, though they were in the midst of a great trial of affliction and though they were in deep poverty, with abundance of joy, they gave. <coughs> They gave sacrificially, trusting God, believing God, that they would reap the benefit. Again, Mark chapter 12, verses 30, 43 and 44, this, this poor widow, she cast in of her want all that she had, even all her living, sacrificial giving. You can't give wholeheartedly without giving sacrificially. I'd like you to consider lastly this morning that wholehearted giving is proportionate, it's willing, it's sacrificial, but lastly, it's cheerful, joyful giving. There's joy in giving to God. Why do we cringe when we think of writing out that check or putting it in the plate have you ever been there? I have. I've cringed. There's been times when I've cringed. But wholehearted giving is not like that. It's cheerful. It's joyous. If you don't give with joy, there's a heart problem that needs to be dealt with. When these Bible principles are understood and when the believer chooses to obey in faith, he finds joy in his giving. Notice with me in chapter 9, again, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, where he says that every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Do you realize that nothing God commands ever turns out to be a disappointment? Do you realize that your life will be a life of joy? Notice I didn't say it will be a life of no tribulation or affliction. It will be a life of joy if you obey God's commands. God's commands are designed to bring you joy, happiness, and satisfaction. Ultimately, the design is to give him glory. But the byproduct in your life and in my life is that we have joy as we follow God's plan. And so nothing that God commands turns out to be a disappointment. The will of God is a path that's paved with joy. But when you and I chafe at the pain of giving, we miss out on that joy. Wholehearted giving requires a proper understanding. We're stewards. We're bound to give. Our giving ultimately is to God. Wholehearted giving requires a proper motivation. Christ gave us a perfect example of giving. We have that motivation of sowing and reaping. And then we have the motivation of our faith, our dependence upon God, our belief that He will take care of us. And thirdly, wholehearted giving requires a proper manner. We give proportionately as God hath prospered us. We give willingly, not holding anything back, not being forced or constrained to give. We give sacrificially. We give as God leads, regardless of what it costs us. And then, th fourthly, we, we give cheerfully. 
when we give wholeheartedly. It is in joy and with joy that you and I must give. These principles of wholehearted giving that we've looked at show show giving to be something that is important to the heart of God. The resources that God has given us are a tool for heartfelt worship toward Him. And so I ask you this morning, how open is your hand this morning? How loosely do you hold your material resources? Do you consider them yours? Or do you recognize them as God's gift to you, His steward? Is your giving a self-determined amount, or is your giving worship-fed and spirit-led? God's church and God's work, get this, will never lack God's supply when His people give wholeheartedly. Father in heaven, we ask you this morning, as is needed, to make us wholehearted givers. And Father, I pray that, Lord, where our hearts and our minds need to be changed and fashioned, molded to the Word of God and to Your truth, that we would just humble ourselves and allow Your Spirit just to change our thinking and our heart attitude. And Lord, I pray that not a one of us would walk out of this room this morning with clenched fists. But Lord, that we would open them up freely for you to take out of our hand everything that you deserve, everything that you desire. And Lord, my prayer this morning is not that Community Baptist Church would be a place that is, uh, Lord, overflowing with uh, financial resources, but simply, Lord, that Community Baptist Church would be a place where God's people give in worship and according to the leading direction of the Holy Spirit, that we do so within the confines of these principles that we've seen in your word. We thank you, dear God, for your guiding truth. We burn it deep into our hearts, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.